good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are listening in today. My name is Kim Sager, and I'm the VP of Communications and Marketing. Today, we're kicking off our first of four webinars for Asset Management Awareness Month. Before we get started and I introduce our speaker, I'd like to run through some logistics. Uh, this webinar today is recorded and will be posted on our MPMA website and YouTube channel later this month. If you're listening today with a group, uh, be sure all participants in the room uh, jot down those names and then email them to me at vpmarketing at mpma.org uh, to ensure everyone receives CEU credit. Um, also, we have a handout um, posted in the GoToMeeting uh, listed under handouts uh, if you need that from the presentation today. And then lastly, if you have questions during the presentation, um, please write them in the chat box. Um, and then we will review them throughout or um, at the end, uh, depending on how we're going through. So now I would like to introduce our speaker today who really needs no introduction, uh, Dr. Douglas Getz. Uh, Doug is a 40-year property professional, former property administrator with DCASMA. Good thing they went down to DCMA after a former professor with the Air Force Institution of Technology, former professor with the Defense Acquisition University, member of the original FAR Part 45 rewrite team, president of GP Consultants, editor emeritus of the MPMA Property Professional, Federal Property Manager of the Year, MPMA Property Person of the Year, MPMA Lifetime Achievement Award winner, author of two books published by MPMA, author and editor of 48 textbooks used in his classes, and Defense Acquisition University Hall of Fame inductee. So allegedly, he knows a little bit about property management. Doug today will be presenting on It Ain't Just Government Property Clause That Affects Government Property. Doug, take it away. Very good. Thank, thank you, Kim. I uh, greatly appreciate the, the introduction. Um, uh, it, it's always a pleasure to do these. I, I never know why so many people sign up for these, but I, I'm glad that you're there. I wish I could see all of you. I, I wish I could hear all of you chuckle when I make some type of stupid comment. But in spite of that, hey, guys, it, it's great that you're here. So you see the topic on the screen. I, I got rid of the ain't part. Uh, let, let's gussy it up a little bit more. It, so the topic is, is there more than the government property clause, right? Uh, when I talk about this, I, I have to cover a few things here. So. Uh, let me start with my slides, and we'll be working on that. So um, I, I imagine some of you have done some research into your genealogy, uh, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, other sites, um, found some really interesting relationships. Now, I'm a good friend with Tom Ruckdashel. Uh We we sort of started pro property careers together and uh, ended up doing a lot of stuff, but he uh, he had done the DNA test through 23andMe, and, and uh uh, found out he has some great relationships and, and was uh, uh, at some uh, portion of Neanderthal in him, which I thought was rather interesting. Uh, uh, I, I did get my DNA results back. Uh, I'm not positive because Ancestry.com does not tell you how much Neanderthal you have in your genes, but the, the reason all of this, that I thought of it in this way, was to look at how the government property clause uh, has relatives in the rest of the FAR, brothers, sisters, children, stepchildren, and I wanted to look at how those relate to uh, the compliance requirements that we have to do with government property, because a lot of them are hidden, and you don't get to see them until bad things happen. So I'm going to walk you through some of these relations and then show you a rather large chart at the end of the presentation how a lot of this comes into play, and I've, I've done this presentation before, and I've added a couple more things to it, and I will still expand it even further with compliance issues. So if, if you're ready, here we go, ladies and gentlemen, all right? So I wanted to look at the, the genesis of the government property clause, looking at the grandparents, and you see two acronyms there, ASPR and DAR, the Armed Services Procurement Regs and the Defense Acquisition Regs. These were the precursor to the Federal Acquisition Regulation, or FAR. 
Barr came out, uh, 1984, uh, the great date for publishing a, a government rig, April 1st, 1984. Uh, yes, uh, they, they were not fooling at the time, but I thought that was a perfect date for them to use. And then, of course, we have the, the current parents, uh, the 2007 version of the FAR. And, of course, we've had later changes with that. Uh, and, again, with, with uh, mentioning Tom Ruckdash, I feel it's important. You know, Tom is the one who was able to haunt you that and get that through uh, the onerous requirements to get any new regulation uh, into, into perspective there. So when we look at the grandparents, we have our uh, ASPR, uh, published in 1947, and then a name change to the DAR. For, for any of you who might have remembered or dealt with that re uh, regulation or those regulations, uh, the, the property requirements were fragmented all over the place. We had policy in Part 13, disposal in Part 24. There were clauses in Part 7, but multiple locations in Part 7 that you hunt, had to hunt around to find out where these were. The contractor requirements were in an appendix, Appendix B, and the government PA direction was in Supplement 3. It's like, oh my goodness, how in the world was anybody supposed to find all of these things? Well, when they did... Uh, um, yeah, there, there's a brief picture there, uh, which is meant to be uh, uh, humorous about an old man. Uh, anybody remember the, the Asper and Dar? I'll, I'll go there. Now, this picture was taken by a, an administrative assistant from the Air Force Institute of Technology, and she approached me and said, Doug, Doug, I found your brother. I'm not going any further with that picture. All right, so... When we look at the old FAR government property clause, right, the old one, the parents, what I call, we have the 1984 version of the FAR. Date issued, as I said, April 1st. Really cool day. Well, the policy worked out really well. All of the policy statements were combined into FAR Part 45. Looking at 45.1 through 45.6, right? Now, uh, that made life a lot easier because we could segregate what was directed to the government, what was directed to the contractor. How were things directed to the contractor? Well, there were the 19 clauses that were extracted from the Aspirin DAR and simply rolled over into the 1984 version of the FAR. The beauty, though, was they were all located in one section. We could go to 52.245. And then look at dash one through dash 19. Now, the issue that I had with that was they didn't fix anything. There were no significant changes to these clausal constructs. They just smushed the parts, smushed the words together, and, and put them in the new one. And our biggest problem was they put all the bad stuff in as well, all the old uh, erroneous material that was there. And if we looked at those clauses, dash one through dash 19, uh, I have dash seven in red because there are still a few consolidated facilities out there for various activities. Uh, for example, the Army ammo plant. But most of these that we're looking at, they should have all gone by the wayside, save for one other. 52.245-17, the special tooling clause. Yes, I've actually talked to people, and they said, no, 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 that's still in our contract, even though the clauses were changed uh, much, much later after that in 2007. Oh, my goodness. So I, I hope that some of you might still remember our history and know where we came from prior to the FAR. And then in the first iteration of the FAR, knowing what we looked like. Well, here we go. Finally, we got to the 2007 version. Started the rewrite in 1995 and had it actually public. So here we were with the 2007. We got all the policy in FAR Part 45. The clause is in 52. But notice, only three clauses. Only three clauses. Wow. Holy moly. Well, when we look at this, we all know about FAR Part 45, right? We all know about Dash 1, so uh, I'm going to skip Dash 2 and Dash 9. I want to, Dash 9, I want to focus on the requirements 
uh, and clauses that directly affect government property and the Dash 1 application because it, it doesn't address all of the requirements. So I want us to think deeply about that. That's why we have the thinker on the right-hand side there. So my, my first question there, in regard to this government property clause, it is, we are assuming, contractually binding. Is that a correct statement? Absolutely. The contractors must comply with it. Government must comply with it. And I know everybody's going to say, with my sub-bullets there, yes, if the clause is in the contract. So let's talk about law just for a tiny bit. What about if the clause is supposed to be there and, and isn't? Well, probably yes, because we have two court cases that support that. The Christian doctrine, which is Geo Christian and Associates, which gave us this first incorporation by reference operation of law, but for the government property clause, the case that's important is Hearts Food Services, which says yes, the government property is there, the government property clause is there. So look, contractors are expected to comply with the requirements of the government property clause as well as the government, right? Sometimes the government loses sight as to their roles and responsibilities, uh, what they need to do. So then I had to start thinking about relations. Relations to the government property clause. What about other clauses? Well, can the government property clause stand alone? Now, I'm not talking about whether it's in the contract or not. I'm only asking, can it stand alone? Are there other clauses that interact with the government property clause in the effort to operationalize its application? So I'm going to talk about a few of them here. Some of these relationships, and you're, I hope that you're surprised to see that some of these are direct, some of these are indirect, and some are really obtuse where you got to say, huh, or hmm, or how did those get, get into this? So few things we need to look at, and I want to start with the government property clause. If we look at 52245-1, it talks about title. And it says that under the cost reimbursement type contracts, the government has title to all property. That's my New Yorkese coming through. Uh, I ask your forgiveness. So my question is, is that true? Well, uh, as many of you have probably heard, uh, I use the answer it depends, right? Uh, it, it depends. If we read that clause a little bit further, it talks about that issue of title, which says for which the contractor is entitled to be reimbursed. Now, if you read the last issue of the Property Professional, Tom Ruckdashel did a great article about the issue of title being instantaneous, claiming title to all, all property. But there is addendums that go on to that application. And, and I need to address some of these, which the contractor is entitled to be reimbursed. Entitled to be reimbursed. So what the heck does that mean? Well, it takes us to another clause, which isn't spoken about at all in, in the government property clause. So first step, we are linked here from the government property clause to this issue of entitlement to be reimbursed. And that takes us to this allowable cost and payment clause, 52216-7. You can't read the government property clause without this clause. In point of fact, they're inexorably linked. As the government property clause is a mandatory clause in cost reimbursement, so is the allowable uh, cost and payment clause. You need to know both of those clauses, right? Nowhere do we see an explicit link with the government property clause to operationalize this linkage. Rather, it's an indirect link, but a critical link. And, and here's the other uh, part that's interesting. It does not once mention government contract, uh, government property or contractor acquired property. You need to see the relationship between the government property clause and the allowable cost and payment clause. That's your job as a property professional there. 
well, what's all this stuff then about the allowable cost and payment clause? How does this come into play? Why am I concerned with this? Well, because within that clause, it defines for contractors and the government what they mean by these issues of allowable cost, right? It incorporates by reference another FAR subpart, 31.2. Now, normally, the FAR protocol is to build everything into the clause that's applicable, that's required, uh, that's binding upon the contractor. But notice here, it's an incorporation by reference because if you look at FAR part, uh, subpart 31.2, it's a lengthy section, a lengthy section, and therefore the clause itself would then turn into like a 20-page clause. Not, not a good idea. So rather, they make an incorporation by reference, which takes us over to subpart 31.2. And within that subpart, it defines for us reasonable, allocable, and allow allowable. With all allowability being defined as, well, reasonable, it's allocability, uh-oh, standards promulgated by the CAS board, and if applicable, otherwise, generally accepted accounting principles. So either you're going to deal with CAS, cost accounting standards, or you're going to deal with GAP, generally accepted accounting principles, one or the other. Not all contractors are bound by CAS. And we also have to be concerned with the terms of the contract and any limitations set forth uh, in the subpart there. So interesting. So um, we're on the issue of cost. Does the contractor uh, have to follow uh, the rules uh, about how they charge property? Well, another indirect link. We saw the uh, requirement for allowable, and then that took us to standards promulgated by the CAS board. Well, we'd either have to look at CAS, cost accounting standards, or GAP, general accepted accounting principles. Well, CAS takes us to another clause. Doug, Doug, wait, wait, wait. <clears throat> All I wanted to do was learn about the government property clause. You can't. It goes far beyond that. No, no pun intended. Yes, it does. It goes far beyond that. You'd have to look at 52.230-2, uh, a cost accounting standard. This requires the contractor to describe how they will treat various costs. Well, how do I see that? Well, take a look at the form that's used. It's a CASB DS1 for the profit-making contractors. Uh, and not, not that they're always making a profit, but they were set up to be profit-making. Or DS2 for non-profits. Uh, those would be the universities that are out there. Activities su such as that. So, need to be aware that there's a distinction a form for, for all of this stuff, so be aware. Now, within that CSB DS1 form, there's a line, a block for material. There's a line or block for special tooling and special test equipment, but they, they don't really call out equipment because within equipment, there are multiple sections that, that deal with, with that stuff, multiple sections that deal with depreciation and amortization. My opinion is it would have been more better to have a cost principle for equipment and a cast line item for equipment to ensure understanding such was not the case. But now think about this. Generally, we, the government, and I'm using the term we, I know I'm not in the government anymore. Uh, the government really doesn't want you to buy as a contractor general purpose equipment because it has utility across multiple lines, across multiple product lines. <coughs> so. Material, yes. No problem with that. We'll pay you for the material used to construct the end item. Special tooling and special test room, if it is truly special, absolutely. Not so much with equipment. And another one that you need to look at under the cost accounting standards, CAS 402, which is one of the more interesting ones because it's rather brief, but it applies a, a very interesting application, and that is the concept of consistency. Charging like items used for a like purpose in a like fashion. So one of the things we encourage people in our classes is to ask to see your disclosure statement. <coughs> Property administrators within the government, you should be looking at this. Property managers within the contractor, you should be looking at this. 
working with your buyers, working with your purchasing activity, working with your contracts people for subcontractors. They should be looking at their disclosure statement to understand and know what they can buy and what they shouldn't be buying, right? Well, if we're talking about this issue of acquisition and being reasonable and allocable and allowable and charge the cast and all this stuff, uh, one of the other things we have to consider about is uh, the acquisition system. Um, and this is interesting because in FAR Part 44, it talks about an approved purchasing system, a purchasing system that, the, that has been reviewed and approved uh, in accordance with this, this part there. So now we're looking at not a property management system, but an acquisition system. Uh, where does that take us? Well, this other aspect called a CPSR, a Contractor Purchasing System Review. Evaluation of a contractor's purchasing of material and services, subcontracting and subcontract management. Wait, wait a minute. Do we as property professionals have to deal with subcontractor control and subcontractor audits and assessments uh, and worry about what property has gone out to, to a sub? Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen. So there is a direct tie with the purchasing system and what we deal with in, in property management. Now, now here's the problem, right? It discusses and defines a purchasing system, but in my opinion, there's a small glitch. I don't see the contractual requirements to have a purchasing system via a clause. Ah. But if you're under the Department of Defense, the DFARS comes to the rescue. A DFARS Clause 252-244-7001 talks about the Contractor Purchasing System Administration, and it is one of the business system rules. One of the business system rules that are out there, which uh, if you're working under DOD, you should be well aware that that can be a painful problem if things do not work out well. In other words, if your system is disapproved, the government has the authority, has the right to withhold certain fundings. 5% if a single system goes down, 10% if multiple system goes down. Now, I did include a link to the DCMA, Contractor Purchasing System Review Guidebook, the CPSR Guidebook, and there, there's the link to it. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it, but from our perspective, as property managers, I, I got just a tiny bit of heartburn with this. I took that guide, I did a search of it, and there is not a single reference to property or government property. Now, it does state that the, the contractor needs to ensure that all applicable POs and subcontracts contain all flow-down clauses. Flow-down clauses. Is the government property clause a clause to be flowed down? And the answer is yes. The answer really is it depends. <clears throat> it depends if uh, the prime is going to provide government property, provide me neither to furnish or allow the acquisition of that if they're going to provide government property to the sub. All right. So does this include the government property clause requirements? Absolutely. So that would be one of the elements that would be reviewed during a CPSR. Now, it does reference material, but in, in that regard, it's in, in regard to buying quality materials, not junk. It does talk about not buying counterfeit parts, but not looking at property the same way that we do. <clears throat> so there's there are these other requirements. Now, not one of them was called out in the government property clause. You have to look at their individual clauses and see how this plays out, all right? A little bit more then. We need to jump on to some other clauses. So here's the first question. Do, do you need to keep records of government property? I'm, I'm giving a little bit of wait time there. And ab absolutely, uh, if you don't think you need to keep records of government property, well, uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope and pray that no property administrator ever comes to audit your system. Yes, you have to keep records. The records are called out in the government property clause, but even more so, 
Take a look at these other two clauses. Audits and records when sealed bidding, audits and records under negotiated contracts, fixed price negotiated, cost reimbursement. Both of these impose, again, an incorporation by reference, an incorporation of FAR 4.7. So now we go from the government property clause to the audits and records clause to FAR 4.7, to 4.705-3, and look at paragraph H, for property records, and they call us out, 45-101 and 52-245-1, those are to be retained for years. Now, now you need to go a little bit further, you have to figure out how to compute those four years by looking at the guidance on computation from the last transaction or action on that record. So, um, uh, and it's important, I'm, I'm concerned about this incorporation by reference uh, a little bit later in this presentation. In the words of Billy Mays, ah, but there's more that we have to look at, all right? So when we look at that, we can go further on and look at some other contractual requirements. How about terminations? <coughs> there are seven references to termination, termination inventory, uh, and termination contracting officer in the government property clause. Seven references to those words. But nowhere do we see a discussion of what is a termination. To find that out, we need to look at the, the termination clause, 52249-6. That is also incorporated there as such a mandatory clause in the contract. As such, we'd be looking to see how does this play out, all right? So need to look at all of that good stuff there from your perspective. If we go on a little bit further and look at that, <clears throat> termination for that cost reimbursement, not once is the term government property used in the terminations clause. Well, that's interesting. Why? Because if there's been a termination, this stuff now becomes termination inventory as defined in FAR 2.101, but it's also embedded in the government property clause under the term contractor inventory, right? Um, wow, oh my goodness, there are all these linkages that we as property professionals need to look at and see and figure out how in the world does all of this play out here? And ladies and gentlemen, this is why you can spend years days, weeks, months, years, and decades studying all the interactions that apply here. So um, what we're trying to, to impress upon you, we're thinking about the depth and breadth as a property professional dealing with government property, do you need to comply with the terminations clause? And the answer is yes. Yeah. When operationalized by a termination notice, the second you are provided a termination notice, all work is to stop and immediately all these other requirements kick in. So I've looked at a few references from the FAR regarding those property requirements, clauses or requirements that are not directly referenced in the government property clause but apply to government property. So indirectly we see four other clauses that impact government property. Yeah, we, we need to know how to work with all of these and figure out what in the world are we supposed to do. But I got a couple others that, that you need to look at, and I refer to these as the children of the FAR government property clause. Back to the, the genealogical stuff here. If any of you work with or for DOD, well, what about the DFARS and its clauses? Are there any direct relationships? And the answer is yep. Under the DFARS, if there is the government property clause of dash one in the contract, then these other clauses become applicable. They must be included in the contract. We see the discussion of the policy in 245.107, which calls out these other clauses that says, look, if the dash one FAR clause is in there, you must have these other clauses. Uh, there's another one that comes out of DFARS 211. Well, that one's a weird one. Why would they be talking about government furnished property in part 211? Well, 
if you looked at old versions of 252, 211, 7007, they, they had a different application. And over the years, they've changed. They've converted this into a reporting clause uh, dealing with reporting of IUD property, government property being reported through the registry or to the, now the, the PIEE GFE module. Um, rather interesting. And if we look at the policy, there's no shall or anything of that nature where we saw before. Rather, it says use. It, it's just an explicit direction. Use. Not if you feel like it. Not if you're a happy camper. Not if you're in a good mood. Uh, this is a mandatory clause. Dash one then kicks in these other clauses. So sort of a visual, you can see that if you have that far 52245F, well, look at these other clauses subsumed underneath it, required by the inclusion of that one FAR clause, the DFARS mandates the inclusion of five other clauses. Okay, okay, wait. So some people are going to say, oh, but Doug, I, I, I don't deal with uh, the DOD. I work for NASA. Well, I hate to tell you this. NASA does the same thing under 1845.107. That numbering system is to comply with the code of federal regulations, the CFR. And I don't expect you to read this chart really even from a humorous standpoint. It was meant to be an eye chart. I just wanted to let you know that it's not only DOD that puts in supplemental clauses, but rather NASA does the same. And, and we could talk to some of the old guard from NASA, uh, Mr. Mike Showers. We could talk to some of the current people that are out there in property. I know Tracy Helmick would be glad to explain some of these to you. I just wanted to show you that comparison that here we have the FAR and DFARS. Well, the same thing happens with NASA. They have the FAR and then the NASA FAR supplement, the NFS. So, um, cool. Very good. Well, wait a minute. What's this thing, the M&M AS? Uh, are we selling candy here or something? Well, if uh, you're dealing with DFARS, there is the Material Management Accounting System, one of the six business uh, system rules that are out there. And implicit within this clause are references to contractor required property, and this is limiting its discussion to material. Things like progress payment inventory and an explicit reference to government furnished material. Oh, oh my goodness. Well, wait. Why didn't they talk about the MMAS in the FAR or this type of application? And to be honest with you, as far as I'm concerned, the MMAS is a systemic approach. It should have been in the FAR and not just a DFARS requirement, but the DOD in the mid-1980s was the one who was concerned about the use of MRP, MRP2, and ERP type systems. My opinion is for the FAR does a rewrite, we should move this clause into the FAR for application in all, all contracting environments because it uses commercial practice that's out there, customary commercial practice. So if you want to see this overlap for a second, here, here we have issues under the MMAS. They deal with acquisition and credits and debits and physical inventory requirements, and consumption, and the reporting of excess, all, all of that interfaces with the MMAS. And I have sort of a little snide comment there. I don't know how in the world you can do a consumption analysis without addressing the requirements of the MMAS, because the MMAS calls out very specific things like master production schedules, bills of material, material requirements lists, a lot of things that we have to deal with in terms of acquisitioning and ordering of, of material that's out there. MMA is restricted to the application for material there. Ah, uh, it gets worse. So we dealt with the children. There are a couple stepchildren out there, in my opinion. Three things that I need to talk about. The ground and flight risk clause. Safeguarding sensitive conventional arms, ammo, explosives. And DMIL, DMIL, that wonderful issue. So first one, uh, a clause that I, as well as many others, hate. 
So I'll be honest with you, I really do not like this clause. I, I think that there are some huge problems. Uh, this tells us the policy that they got to use this clause in, in all solicitations and contracts for the acquisition, development, production, modification, maintenance, repair, flight. L look, if this was a fixed price contract, and they, they eliminate FAR Part 12 under item I, I but this was a plain uh, uh, vanilla FAR Part 14 fixed price contract, I would have real worry about this clause being in that contract, even though it says all solicitations and contracts for acquisition, development, production. Notice uh, that's a very broad, broad statement there. That's not the big part there. Rather, the important stuff is this next slide, all right, uh, that goes on here. Come on, we can move on there. Um, so from a pricing arrangement, I can use this clause in plain fixed price contracts, FAR Part 14, fixed price contracts with progress payments, or even cost reimbursement type contracts. Um, wait a minute, that, that's kind of tough there. We have to then ask the question, well, aren't government furnished aircraft government property clause? But there's no explicit requirement to use this clause with the government property clause. And this clause covers a, a lot more than government furnished property. It may also apply to CAP. It may also apply to progress payments inventory. And for those of you guys who are dealing with aircraft, it has language that alters the government's usual risk of loss provisions. And in one instance, even states that the liability provisions of the government property clause do not apply. Well, wait a minute. The liability provisions of the government property clause do not apply? Which liability provision? The full risk of loss? The limited risk of loss? Okay. So that, that's another topic that we could spend hours on. That's not my main concern. But here's the deal. Are there regulations imposed by this clause that were or might never have been subject to a public comment requirement, which I don't think is really that cool. Notice under the ground and flight risk clause, it calls in this joint services manual as an incorporation by reference. Incorporation by reference. Incorporation by reference. Remember we said some other things, FAR 31.2, incorporated by reference. FAR 4.7, incorporated by reference. But all of those requirements would have been published for public comment. To my knowledge, in my review, my, my academic analysis, nowhere did I find this manual, this combined regulation instruction, published for public comment. And that sort of bothers me a little bit. I consider this sort of an orphan that's out there. So uh, the regulation instruction contains 45 references that states the contractor shall. Well, wait, that's direction to the contractor. It becomes a contractual performance requirement. And, and that worries me, because if this is binding upon the contractor, it should have gone through the contractual requirement of a public comment period. But every ground and flight risk rep I spoke with, and I have not found any publication of this document for public comment, which leads me to go, hmm, all right. So, so here's my little attempt at humor here. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, 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 the Mumbi Moonstruck. Um, is this a compliance issue? If you're dealing with aircraft as government property, you had best know this clause. Not only the government property clause, but the ground and flight risk clause. Does this affect government property? Absolutely. But if you remember the scene where they're all around the kitchen table and, and they're discussing the marriage proposals and who's marrying who and why and all this stuff, the grandfather says, I'm so confused. And ladies and gentlemen, when I read the ground and flight risk clause, that's the exact way that I feel. A few more than arms, ammo, and explosives. Oh my goodness, we have to worry about that. Here is another incorporation by reference. The contractor shall comply with 5100.76-M. Okay, hang on. We have 
not only a government property clause dealing with government property, but we now have a DFARS clause that has other DFARS clauses, and we have this clause that incorporates a manual. Guys, it ain't just the government property clause. If you're dealing with A, A, and E, you need to be aware of these other clauses. Here's another example of a manual being incorporated by reference. A short clause, the clause itself is short, but it incorporates by reference 83 pages of requirements <clears throat> with 107 references to contractors. Uh, in a phrase that I often use in class, OMG, right? Can this be a problem if you don't follow those that other manual? Absolutely. So a long time ago, in, in a world far away to coin the opening to Star Wars, a galaxy far away to, to uh, coin a, a phrase from Star Wars, it can have deadly consequences. This was one of my contractors as a property administrator back in 1983. I imagine that some of you who are listening right now were not even born in 1983. Uh, don't raise your hands. This company had explosives. They blew up. They weren't following the manual. All right? They weren't following all the requirements. And regrettably, a number of people lost their lives, reported in the New York Times. They were, they were one of my contractors. So you can imagine how many reports I wrote. There's demilitarization requirements also. I'm sure that many of you deal with demil. Major issue there. And within 7004, one of our DFARS government property clauses, here is another incorporation by reference. Oops. Again, I'd like to know, has this ever been published for public comment? The uh, Defense Demilitarization Manual 4161-21-M, three different volumes out there, another manual. And it ain't just one manual. There are multiple volumes of that manual that cover a variety of different things. Should you have access? Should you have copies of these? Absolutely. It ain't just the government property clause that you need to be aware of when dealing with government property. There's a lot more guidance, direction, requirements in the DFAR 7004 clause regarding DMIL and certification and who gets to sign off. Can this have problems? Absolutely. Not far from where I live, uh, there was a DCMA, Quality Assurance Rep, who signed off falsely on DMIL certs. That Quality Assurance Representative from DCMA went to jail. Is demilitarization critical? Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that is one of the key areas that we, we need to be really really concerned with, all right? Um, so here are three clauses I just looked at. Ground and flight risk, safeguarding sensitive conventional arms, ammo explosives, demilitarization. The bottom line, it's not enough to know a clause, know a single clause. One must know what's embedded in that clause. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So you want to see how this plays out as a visual Hold on to your hats, because here it comes. <clears throat> notice we have the government property clause in the central position. But notice also that there are the DFARS clauses in light green that relate to government property. We have the audit and records negotiation on yellow on the top. That drives us to 4.7. 4.7 drives us back to the government property clause. We have the allowable cost and payment clause in yellow. That takes us over to the contract cost principles and procedures and incorporates 31.2 as a contractual requirement. If we go to the top left-hand corner, there's the ground and flight risk clause, which applies to joint service regs. We have the MMAS requirement there, interacting with the government property clause. We have the purchasing system requirements. We have the use and charges clause, we have the contractor property management system, which links to the business system rules. We have the reporting loss of government property, which we just had a, a DOD deviation come out last month, 
mandating that contracting officers use different language to allow or to incorporate the requirements of PIEE and the loss module under the GFP module. Ladies and gentlemen, if you think you only need to know the one clause there, you are absolutely positively confused because there are so many others that, uh, that deal with all of these. Arms, ammo, and explosives, defense demilitarization, a whole bunch of that stuff, folks, that you need to be aware of. So, you know, we can look at this in regard to an iceberg. You've all heard the story that, you know, we know what is above the waterline. That we know as the government property clause. But if you're a true property professional, you need to know what's below the waterline because there are a whole bunch of other clauses and requirements there. So uh, with that, I encourage you, learn all that you can. Perform your job the best you can, the best and the most professional way that you can. And I wanted to put a picture here of a professional, but I didn't know what a professional looked like, so I sort of just left it blank. Look to your left, look to your right if you're alone, look in the mirror. You are all professionals in, in my idea. And no, my nose did not grow larger like the Geico commercial, all right? Two thoughts I, I want you to think about that as I've grown older, I've always tried to be. Number one, whatever you are, be a good one. If you're going to be a property professional, work and study and strive to be the best that you can. But I also have a spiritual side to my life, and I, I love this quote because I, I really try and do it uh, as best I can. Do I do it all the time? I fail many times. But John Wesley, uh, who was a theologian, uh, a religious person, an evangelist trying to bring people uh, to, in his faith, Methodism, Christianity, says this, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. So I encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, go, go out there and do good. Bottom line, I've run through a whole bunch of slides. I've got a few minutes left for questions, but th there I am. That's my name. There's my, my email address, uh, there is my website, there is my phone number. So uh, guys, if, uh, if you need to reach out, um, by all means, I'd be glad to, to speak with you. Uh, it is a, a 1-900 number, but we do make you go away smiling. Uh, payment normally is in the form of a Diet Coke next time you see me. So uh, Kim, what I'd like to do now, I don't see any questions on there. Are there any questions out there? Um, Doug, I've been filtering a few um, as you've been talking that I've seen come in, um, mostly relative to um, getting a copy of the presentation, which we did attach in the GoToMeeting. Um, in the handouts portion of your GoToMeeting view, uh, you should see a PDF copy. Um, and then... So by one, willing to share this presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Hang it up on your wall with that big chart. Blow it up so you remember all these stinking clauses. Yes. And then um, the only other question I just want to reiterate was someone had a question about um, the email address to send names to for CEU credit. It, if you are currently on the, um, like, logged in and registered under the GoToWebinar right now, we will see your name. It's those folks who are in the room with you and not um, registered themselves. The email address again is vpmarketing at npma.org. So that's how you get your CEU credit. Um, other than that, Doug, I have not seen any other questions come in. Well, that means that everybody's gone away either happy or really sad, and they're going to send me nasty grams. Now, seriously, if you have any questions, please feel free. Uh, there was a lot of material here. My my objective was to take one clause, 52245-1, and show how it can explode into a dozen other clauses with multiple other contractual requirements, hopefully expanding the depth and breadth of your knowledge. So. Um, Unless anybody's got a question, Kim, I'm a happy camper. Well, Doug, thanks again for speaking today. 
Um, I haven't seen any more come in, but I do want to mention that our next webinar is uh, for Asset Management Awareness Month is scheduled for Wednesday, March 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, Yvonne Batcher will be presenting that webinar on Property 101 Strategies for Adding Value to the Essential Role of Asset Management. Uh, you can register for that webinar on our MPMA website under our Asset Management Awareness Month uh, page, or uh, look out for tomorrow's news flash. There'll be a link in there as well to register. So hope everybody had um, uh, enjoy the presentation and has a great rest of their day. Goodbye. Bye.